Yeah, yeah, and, but I have to grind them back. You can take it back. Oh, Jesus, and I can't. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. It's starting to become 1 p.m. in Prague. Please have a seat. <laughs> Welcome to the IETF 118 Joint Ops Area and uh, OPSA WG meeting. Uh, I'm Hank. Next to me is Tehran and Joe. We are your esteemed chairs and uh, want to welcome you to uh, a session that is under the note well that I hope everybody is familiar with. This is about the um, content. Uh, there are a lot of links in BCPs that tell you uh, when to sell what and what that means. Please uh, read that if you haven't done that yet. Um, there's also the note really well that is about uh, conduct and not about content. Um, effectively, uh, I would advise uh, that you be uh, behaving in a way to another individual that you want them to behave towards you. So be nice. If that doesn't work out, uh, there are people you can speak to. You come to the chairs, at these, and there's an ombudsman. So please uh, talk with us about that if there's a problem with the conduct you experience here on ITF meetings. Um, there's a tool uh, at the data tracker. The data tracker enables you to uh, join this session via Meet Echo. If you just want to raise a hand, there's a hands raise tool for your cell phone or mobile device that's relatively convenient. You can also use a full-fledged Meet Echo client. It's a little bit new, but I think the raise hand at the bottom of the screen is still easy to find. And that's for everybody to have a fair chance to attend either locally or remotely. So we have a queue that can accommodate both kind of participants. Um, whatever you do and find, uh, you can, of course, on the technical side, uh, file an issue. Meet Echo really uh, benefits from that, especially that we have a new client now. And when, if I look at my client, it's pretty doing funny things. So I'm filing an issue about that. If you see funny things happening with your Meet Echo client, maybe do that too. Coming to uh, our agenda for today, I already introduced, introduced us the chairs. Um, we are in dire need of a note taker. A note taker will click at the notes icon on the data tracker next to the OPSA WG uh, item in the agenda and will make notes on Hatchdog, which is a notes ITF tool. We rely on that. That is a vital part of the ITF process. And unfortunately, um, I have to ask one of the, or maybe the two of the attendees here at the raw remote to do that. Are there any volunteers? And I heard there's coffee for free somewhere. You provide the coffee? No, there are baristas. Oh, we have one. Thank you so much. Moving on. Um, and this is just, uh, this is not mandatory, but uh, typically when we start to uh, adopt documents, uh, we uh, assign a shepherd now. At this point of time, we always assign the shepherd. That's not new. But we would like to assign them on the time of adoption. So uh, it's easier for um, the shepherd to remember what happened with the document. Uh, document shepherding is a, uh, a relatively easy job. You know, there's not much to do. Just to have to take interest in the document and its progress. And in the end, when we go into working group last calls and such, the job of a shepherd is to write up a history of this document and some other items that have happened. There's a list for that, like a questionnaire, to help the AD of the area to uh, then do their own review. So uh, a document shepherd is like a micro chair for a single document and can help with that. And uh, that is a good opportunity to get some experience and hands on. So um, whenever we do a working group last call, um, we will also do a call for a shepherd that is not the chairs. The chairs can do that. But if all documents are just shepherd by the chairs, there's some bias, first of all, to it. Also, it's a bottleneck. So just wanted to announce right here, there's a good opportunity to get some IETF process experience by becoming a shepherd. Don't be shy. Just contact us, and we will, again, issue calls for shepherds on the list whenever we try to adopt a document. Coming to the status, and uh, maybe I'm giving this over to you. Yeah, I think. Sure. So we have um, a couple new RFCs published, and we have uh, so 
congratulations or, or thank you as well to the uh, authors, contributors, and the working group on 9445 and 9472. Uh, we also have a ton of work uh, that is almost, it's on the verge of uh, being an RFC. So we have the segment routing, uh, IPv6, uh, IPv6, IPfix, uh, SRV6. We have the uh, uh, SNMP, uh, I always get this wrong, TLSTM. Uh, those are just about ready for um, final publication as RFCs. And you can see we have a few other documents uh, submitted to IESG for publication. The big thing are the, or is the 13, or actually it's more, he, he Hank, Hank had to do ellipses here. Um, we already have a, a number of working group documents and we just adopted four more. The attachment circuit work uh, was, was just adopted and just became working group documents as of this morning. Um, so there's quite a bit of work and that's why today or this time in, in IETF 118, we have two uh, working group sessions. We have today and then we have an hour on Wednesday so, so people can, can share their, their work. Um, so that's status. You want to add anything, Chandra? Um, I want to add that we received two liaisons uh, in the mailing list, and uh, we believe it's not actually uh, of CWG work. So we dispatched them uh, one to the uh, content network RG, and the, the other uh, dispatched to the MPS working group. Sorry, I'm trying to get our, uh, apparently the notes have to be, um, uh, have to be initialized. Let's do that. So if one, actually if one of you can, can go and do the, the hedge doc, the notes.itf.org, put something in for 118. Um, the last thing we wanted to say before we get into our uh, main program today, NOMCOM. So we have until Friday, I think you said, Hank? We have until Friday, uh, there are a number of people, including three up for ops area director um, in the NOMCOM bucket and pool. Uh, so submit your feedback, go to the tool, find people that you want to submit feedback that you know, that you have experience with, and definitely give us that feedback. With that, we have a number of presentations today. So we have some adopted work up front. We have three adopted documents. Uh, then we have some non-adopted work or unadopted work, other work. And then we will go into the ops area portion uh, with Rob and Warren, they'll come up. Uh, I think they just have an open mic uh, for us today, uh, but they might have other things as well. So we have time. We have some buffer in the agenda. Uh, the hope is that we actually do give ops area their due this time. Um, uh, but we want, obviously, or not, but we want, as always, we want good discussion uh, with the presentations. So first up, I think we have Ned, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, Ned. Oh, or Benoit, perhaps. All right, good afternoon, I'm Benoit, so I'm not mad. Uh, you know the stupid game, I dare you. So I was discussing with Matt, so I have not seen the slides, but uh, so I'm going to present anyway the first draft. So this is what uh, the game is about. <laughs> so this uh, IP fix three draft, I'm going to present the first one on the fix. Next slide, please. So we've got those three drafts and they are working with documents. We started for the history with a simple fix to the registry of IP fix. And then when we look at this, we're thinking, well, why not make the registry correct? So the first one was exactly this one, the IP fix uh, fixes. Then we realized that there were some TCP option templates, sorry, uh, information elements that we had to, uh, Maybe not have in the fix itself, but in the other documents. And the last one, the UDP IP fix, also some information elements about UDP. So as I wrote in my slide, the last two documents may be merged. 
but uh, somehow we prefer to keep them separate because of dependency on the UDP options specification in TSWG. Next slide, please. So on the first one, the RFC 7125 update, we passed the call and ITF last call. Uh, the second set of draft, the IP fix fixes is uh, adopted like the other one. We had like two or at least two versions uh, since the last ITF. So now we're seeking for cross working group reviews. Uh, we send a message to six men for the, the TCP uh, one and uh, to TSW, uh, TSV, TSV working group for the UDP IP fix. Uh, no feedback so far, but we received good feedback from the IP fix IE doctors. They've been helping a lot on the fixes draft and they, they, they agree on what we want to do and receive feedback from Eric Vink. So, uh, and this one is for you, Matt. So I, so I win? Good. <laughs> Yes, so um, if you focus on the, I would say, on the um, IPv6 extension header, so we started with one information element and we ended by uh, having four information elements to cover, I would say, the, um, the, um, the IPv6 extension headers. So currently in the, in the draft, we're currently able to, I would say, to, 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 to report how multiple, I would say, extension header chains are achieved in a given chain. So this is something that can be exported in the previous um, specification we had. We can also export, I would say, the length of the extension headers. Um, and also whether the, um, uh, what we are exporting is what exactly the router or the element is observing, or this is something which is limited by, I would say, by the software limitations. So this is something that we can really provide to the collector. So it, the, I uh, would say, the interpretation of the information can, can really be um, uh, accurate. Um, we also export, I would say, the order and also the, uh, the aggregate of the, uh, of the information elements there by the, um, when they are really observed in the, in, in the packet. Uh, there are some subtlety in the way the extension header are, I would say, inserted in IPv6 packets. Some of them, they are not, the, I would say, consecutive. And for that one, we, um, because we, we want really to be um, as close as what is observed, we don't aggregate them and we really um, just, I would say, re report information about the consecutive ones. Uh, we also made, I would say, some um, tweaking about the, the encoding of the information for the sake of having something which is really uh, more uh, optimal in terms of the, um, the size of the information we are, uh, we are exporting. And we uh, specified, I would say, the dependency between the various information elements because we don't only have one, we have multiple ones. So there are some dependency between the information that are exported. And we also, um, with Benoit, we, we added some example to, um, to show how the various information elements can be, uh, can be, uh, can be used. Next slide, please. Um, so in, in this slide, we are showing, I would say, the current uh, extension header, which is the uh, um, information element, which is used by the um, existing implementation to, to export the, um, the extension headers. And, in, and as you see here in this, in this encode, and this one is really suboptimal. Because each time, for example, you will see a destination option there or an extension header. This will be the one which is the, the most significant one, and you, you will need to, uh, to use 30 bits only for, for this, and this is really uh, not suboptimal. So what we are doing here in the, uh, in the new specification of the extension header is that we are reverting the way we are encoding the information. So the, um, the, 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 uh, the most, I would say, extension header that are uh, likely to be encountered in the packet are put in the less significant bits rather than most sig significant bits. So we will be using less bits when exporting this information. Next slide, please. Um, this is an excerpt of the new registry that we are adding in the, in the new uh, IP fixes, fixes, fixes draft. And in this one, we have, we ha there are, I would say, some entries that are not extension header per se, but those ones we are in inerting them because those were already defined in the, in the existing extension, I would say, um, IPv6 extension header um, information element. And we received a comment from, from Eric Vink when he uh, was reviewing the document that it would be good to know whether there is, I would say, the extension header is followed by a payload or there is no next extension header at the, um, uh, just right after the um, extension header in IPv6 packet. 
um, I, initially, I was against that, 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 that insertion because for me, this is not, I would say, aligned with the uh, spirit of the extension headers themselves. But he, he uh, convinced me that this is better for the, for the sake of the observability to have this information. And it is really similar to the, to the way the unknown, I would say, extension header are inserted in the packet. So th then the next issue we had is where to insert it in the, um, I would say, in the, in the registry. So we decided to go for the lower values so that if we encounter this kind of values in the NAPv6 packet, this won't impact the size of the whole extension header that will be, uh, that will be uh, exported to a collector. Next slide, please. Um, there was um, a pending issue we had last time discussion whether we, we will need to, to export also the, um, the destination and the routing options. So we have, there, there's a trade-off between uh, having something which is really comprehensive between something that is really implementable and, and, and useful. And our call, at least with, with Benoit, what we decided is that we, this kind of export will be out of scope. Um, and if there is a need for, I would say, some specific routing header options to be exported, we just uh, ask people to follow the same, um, I would say, path that was followed by the uh, segment routing uh, header by, by Thomas. Um, and the people can, can define their, their own extension header to cover that, that point. Next slide, please. Did you want to get feedback on the question? Now yes. I, 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 yes you Any opinions? I guess then uh, your ah. So I was trying to find the new Q button on the new interface. Um, so, with, is, are you saying are you okay with this approach? Is that the, the both the left out of scope for now, and or the if we do it, we do it that way. Um, is it to do it that, that way. That means that we, we leave it out of scope, and if people they are interested, they can come to the working group and ask if there is a need for right, for the specific I would say routing option or destination option to be exported in Netflix. Because otherwise, we will be opening, I would say, it's too much work for us to, I would say, I, just for a reminder, I started with a, with a really small fix in the TCP and I ended with four documents and I don't want to last my life dealing with this document. So we need to be, I would say, pragmatic here to find the right balance between something which is really useful and something that can be uh, comprehensive. Makes complete sense to me. Thank you. Um, so this is for, for TCP. Um, in this slide, we are showing the current encoding we have for the TCP option. The, the map in there in the existing RFC is really weird. They don't know how we ended having this in, in RFC. Um, but anyway, what, what, we dis, what we decided there for, at least for the two documents here in OPSA working group is that we will just align the description in the simple fixes with the drawing to see that the drawing off will be the authoritative one. But then we will remove, I would say, that, that, that problem we have the description. And for the, um, the new uh, TCP option um, in, information element, we will use an encoding that will optimize the, the number of bits that will be uh, required to report the absorbed TCP option in a given flow. Next slide, please. Um, another, I would say, item which is, which is really minor is that in TCP there is what we call the, the shared TCP option. This is for experimentation, if you will. And then there is a specific field which is called the experimentation IDs. And in the specification, there are two flavors of the extension headers, one which is encoded in two bytes and the other one which, is, which are encoded in four bytes. Uh, so if we just merge all of them and then we export them, there is um, um, an issue at the collector side to identify and to decode the um, experiment identifier uh, themselves because we don't know whether this is um, a four byte or a two byte. So for the simplicity, what we went with Benoit that we, will, we just define two information elements, one for two byte and one for, um, for the four bytes. And then there is this, um, I would say some optimization whether we can mix, um, I would say the two bytes and the four bytes by artificially encoding the two bytes one as a four byte ex experimentation ID uh, but we decided to uh, just to leave this, um, I would say, to be silent about this. Um, it's not, I would say, we are not encouraging the implementation to do so, but if an implementation decided to encode a, a two-byte as a four-byte extension experiment ID, this, this can be decoded with no problem, so there is no interoperability issue, but we are not um, encouraging the implementation to, to do that. Next slide, please. Um, this is another comment we received from Eric about the, the splitting of the document. We have so far 
about the IPv6 extension, um, extension header and for TCP, uh, for the TCP, um, TCP matters. Um, he thinks that it's better to display this into, uh, into two documents. Um, at least my take on this is that we don't need to, to do that. I prefer to have one single document, no need to, um, to, to have extra load just for this. Um, but this is um, a question for the, for the working group, whether the, the agree on our, with our position or not. Any thoughts from the working group? As chair, I think if this is what you wanna, it, getting it through, if you feel that, that the feedback you're getting in the single document, it makes sense to keep it that way. I, I know in some other documents, there seemed to be additional scope creep and it made sense perhaps to split that out here. It doesn't sound like that is gonna be the case. Yeah, for, for me, it's, it's just okay to, to have both, yeah. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so for for the next step, so we, I think that we are we have a stable content for um, the three uh, the three documents. So we would like to have a working up last call for all of them, um, with a request for our chairs just to um, to include the TCPM, TSV working group, six man, and IPFIX uh, mailing list for the um, for the working up last calls, and for the early director reviews, we would like to uh, just it's up to you uh, chairs whether you want to run. To, to run those in parallel with the working group last call or before, um, with our recommended, I would say, directorate for each of the three uh, of three documents. And that's all what I have to, to say for. Um... Yeah, I, actually, as chair, I appreciate that you broke out who, who should be included in some of these uh, uh, our directorate reviews. Um, I, I just put a directorate review out for the um, geolocate. Uh, um, this document, so, I, I, uh, so I, I, I think I personally, I would like to do this just at the same time as, as last call and do like this a last call review. But, um, yeah, we'll see if we can get them. It's it's been kind of quiet actually in the directorate, but hopefully we'll we'll get some feedback. Mm -hmm. Looks like we have two minutes. Any other comments from the working group? Hmm. Nothing on or. Chat. Thank you, Matt. See, I think we've got Chifang. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Chifang, and this presentation is about a young data model and the radius extension for policy-based network access control. Um, next slide, please. So uh, this work has been adopted after the ITF 117, and we also informed the, uh, the Redis extension, the RedX working group to help review uh, the new Redis uh, attribute, which we call the user access group ID definition part, uh, so that this uh, uh, user group ID can, uh, as a result of the, the, the Redix authentication and can be further used for uh, the access control uh, group group ID based access control enforcement and uh, generally I, I think we have re uh, received a lot of good review comments from both the ops area working group and the Red X working groups and uh, so thank you all for pr provide your comments and suggestions and generally the authors think that all of the uh, comments should have been resolved in the, let the latest version of the draft. And except for that, there are still open issues that are pending now waiting to be uh, resolved in the, the next revision. The first is that uh, should we specify any uh, mechanism for the endpoint group string to be mapped as, uh, as the ID so that this ID can be easily carried uh, in the, the packet header, like M MO3 header. And the second issue is about to consider add some text about what hardware ramification might exist and what operational trade-offs uh, implementations would consider if some advanced feature of SL is intended to be used. And of course, I think uh, we welcome everyone to report their uh, issues and propose change on our GitHub repo. Are you on the queue? 
Uh, yeah, Joe Clark, Cisco contributor. I wasn't clear why exactly you made the group ID a string from an integer. You, you touch on it here, the draft changed it from a 32-bit, I think, integer to a 64-character string, but it wasn't really clear in the text why that change was, was needed. And, I, and you said to carry it in the packet header, I would think carrying an integer would be equally as easy. If it's, if it's a, 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 like a, a integer value type, then it could be easily to be encapsulated as a packet header, like 103 header, so that can be enforced some easy uh, group-based access control. Does but, it make sense? But you moved it to a string, if I read that correctly. You won't do it with string, right? No, no, no. I, I thought it should have been an integer, but you, it looks like you changed it to be a string. Now we have moved it as uh, defined as a string, and we are thinking whether we should specify any mechanism to for the string to be mapped as the ID. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Raise the mic. To... Okay. Perfect. <laughs> Next slide. So this slide gives a summary of the high-level document updates since the last ITF meeting. I think the most significant update is that we now have moved the definition of schedule young data model into a separate draft, which has been submitted in Ops Area Working Group. And uh, we uh, use the groupings defined in that schedule young uh, draft uh, in this document to uh, in, enable the date and time best access control enforcement. Uh, I will present in the next slide. And the second update is that uh, we have changed the document title and add a reference to policy so that the, now the, I think the document title contains what it, the draft is actually about. And we also changed the group ID as a string and uh, uh, fix the related examples accordingly. We think that uh, a string might be uh, uh, might allow for some hierarchy uh, that which might be useful to is the coordination of different endpoint groups. And we also took some uh, Red X uh, session session based on the Red X working group feedback, and also add a restriction to the length based on their comments. And we add the informative reference to one of the individual drafts in that the Red S working group for the authentication method recommendations and uh, use the derived type definition to is the leaf reference of node and also add the as some IPv6 examples beside the IPv4 to show how the, uh, the, the, the SCR policies could be used. Next slide. So as I mentioned earlier, the, regarding the separation of the scheduled young data model from the, this draft, we have submitted a, a 00 version draft in Ops Area Working Group. Uh, it's a complete new ID, but it borrows uh, heavily from the, the 00 version of the UCL document. I think, I believe it's 95% uh, of the contents. And there are remaining uh, contents. We add some reference to some ongoing efforts related to the scheduling. Uh, as far as uh, uh, the, the authors know now, we have uh, three related uh, work that has uh, touch some thoughts about the scheduling. And then it's the, the OIM, a scheduling OIM test in Ops Area Working Group, and, and also this UCL document. And the third effort is in uh, TVR Working Group, time variant, time variant routine in routine area, uh, which is about uh, to manage the network resources uh, with time schedule changes. And in the, uh, the schedule young draft, there are currently two groupings have uh, defined in the ITF schedule young module. And I think this is uh, uh, conformance to the definition of the period and the current rule formats defined in the RFC 5545. This is an, uh, an, effort, an effort of the application area. And this is an existing view we don't really want to reinvent. So just directly translate the information model to the young data model. And this 
uh, defines a comprehensive, uh, a quite comprehensive definition, uh, which is intended to be applicable for common scheduling information, such as event policy and schedule service or resources based on the date and time. So uh, given the common interests of different work, we have uh, planned a side meeting at this Tuesday afternoon, uh, 3 p.m. Uh, from 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. The room is occurring for, uh, we would like to seek some coordination among authors of different documents, uh, both to see if the current definition uh, is sufficient for the various requirements and see uh, to eliminate any potential overlap if there are some similar schedule definition. And we might also uh, explore whether we need a common uh, scheduled framework for the scheduled service. So if you are interested, uh, you can feel free to join the meeting. Next slide. Chief, Chief Wang, did you send uh, my ops uh, chairs and, and, and regular email gets mixed? Did you send this to the list, the, the side meeting? Uh, no, we did not send the list to the mailing list, but we can send yeah, it after please. this meeting. Please, thank you. Thank you. Next slide. So for the, the next step, uh, we will bring the site meeting achievement back to the working group and then continuously work on the common schedule young data model, uh, which this document normally not normatively depends on. So uh, we, we don't want to uh, get things slowed down because we this draft has already adopted by the working group and has normative reference. And then we will resolve the open issues um, of this draft, and then I, I believe this should be resolved in the next revision. And then we will get back to the working group for the review the document updates and provide the feedback. I think that's all. Thank you. Got about a minute for questions, comments? Thank you, Jifeng. Thank you. Jean, I think you're up. Hello. Hello. Give me a sec. That's you. Yeah. All you. Thank you. Uh, so this is an update on the status of the data manifest draft. So uh, next slide, please. So to recall quickly, the goal of the data manifest is to be able to understand a posteriori what is the information that we collected and how we collected that information. Um, so basically, uh, the idea is to define some kind of data format for that that is independent, uh, let's say, of the de underlying devices and the, 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 the modules that these devices actually implement. So next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, do you not see slide three? Ah, I have, yeah, I see, I see it, no, sorry. Yeah, so basically to explain the, the issue of uh, how to interpret, let's say that at time one, we have a counter that is uh, at a value of uh, 42 and the status that is up. We need to understand if, it's, if we don't see any other value, what does it mean? Does it mean that the telemetry is not working? Does it mean that um, it's actually because this value didn't change and we have a unchanged um, subscription, which means that we won't receive update until it changes? Uh, or maybe just that uh, the period of collection is actually very large and we didn't see, the, the, we didn't reach the next update point yet. So basically the, the idea is to have all this information so that whenever we want to do some uh, analysis on this data and for instance, look for anomaly or try to close the loop, uh, we can correctly interpret the data a posteriori. Okay, next slide, please. So we have two manifests, the platform manifest, which is about the entity that is producing the data. So if it's a device, it will, uh, contains the, the, the OS model version of the device. Uh, it also contains the Yang modules that are supported by the device. And the data collection is about uh, 
how the, the collection is configured uh, and uh, the, so the, the information about the, the actual subscription. Um, and basically, this manifest needs to be stored with the, the data uh, so that whenever we access the data, we can retrieve the corresponding manifest. Uh, next slide, please. So for the changes, uh, this is the, the main change is that we have added one example of data manifest, which can give us a feeling of how it can be useful. So on the left, we have the platform manifest. Uh, for the sake of brevity, in the young library uh, part, I didn't put the list of modules, but we should have the list of modules there and imported modules. Um, and on the right, we have the example of um, what is a data collection manifest. Actually, we have two subscriptions here. We have one on-change subscription uh, to the status, administrative status of the interface. This is the first one. And the second one is uh, the number of octets uh, in octets for that, that were received by the interface. Uh, and what we can see already with uh, this is that the first one is unchanged. So, for instance, we have the answer that if we didn't receive any data, it's because it was unchanged. Um, and the second one, uh, we can see that, for instance, it's overloaded and we requested a period of uh, 10 seconds, but actually we have 20 seconds. So, we have a uh, we probably, the, let's say, the device is overloaded and cannot accommodate the period of 10 seconds. So yeah, that's uh, one example. So next slide, please. So the big uh, issue that we have with this draft, which I spent a lot of time on the last meeting, is uh, the Yang modeling issue. Uh, so that it's uh, kind of hard to re-include the existing modules, notably for the uh, IETF uh, Young Library. Actually, it's okay because there is a grouping, but then we kind of lose the, the, the augmentation. And um, for the uh, and for the, the young the young push, sorry, it was very hard to, re to retrieve. So we did a copy pasted version. Uh, and so we are, we are working on this new draft, which is actually called Full Include. And I just sent a message on the mailing list uh, about that. Uh, Rob, you have a question? Yep. Yep. Lost one of the mics. Maybe the battery died in it. We have another one. This room is huge, so. We have like bikes for days. I'll just go outside and sort of speak from there. Um, so Rob Wilson, so could you go back a slide, please? Sure. So on your example on the right, which I can now no longer read, um, I'm wondering if when you send that data, does it get sent uh, when the subscription is set up, or do you send it more frequently when data is being sent? So just wondering, the one on the left is clear that you sort of that's that's sent less frequently, but when does the other data on the right get sent? Yeah, so what we said in the draft, I think, is that the ideal would be to have an unchanged subscription because basically uh, this change, for instance, of the actual period uh, is the one that would be like not controlled but should be kind of limited. And otherwise, it's only when there is a change in the subscription configuration that you need to, that you need to update it and unchanged is perfect for that. Okay, thank you. Rob, it might make sense to bring that mic up here. Perhaps the density of the room is more towards the front. Oh, thank you, Billo. Okay, so, and uh, so we have another question, which is about the interaction with the uh, uh, software bill of material. Um, for which uh, we are investigating whether the draft from Diego uh, could be uh, used to make the link with, with, that, uh, with that work. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we are still have some open questions. So 
uh, about uh, handling the absence of values, we think that uh, as authors that this should be uh, out of scope. So basically, that uh, this this this, uh, this is the way we want to resolve this open question. Uh, we have um, to make the link with the inventory efforts, and that would be um, the. Uh, to make that link, we could use the, the node ID uh, from the from the RFC 8345. Um, so this is the this is our, our proposition, and there is also a question like to the to the room about if there is anything that we we should have in this data manifest uh, that is that is not uh, that is not included in in the current version. Any questions or answers, suggestions, comments from the working group? Okay, well, um, I think on the list, if people have anything to uh, specifically, is there anything missing, as Jean, as Jean said, from the manifest, please let them know. Uh, and I think on Wednesday, we have something from Olga on some readout around 8345 and, and applicability in certain areas. So. Thank you, Jean. Thank you. John Evans. It's John. Ah. Ah, here we are. Great. All you. Thanks. Um, hi, my name is John Evans. Um, I'm one of the co-authors of uh, this draft. We checked in relatively recently. Um, I'm not going to talk about the detail of the draft. I'm going to try and take you, uh, take you through why we wrote this draft, why we think it's needed. Uh, next slide, please. Um, okay, so I think we can probably all agree that the basic job of a network is to transport packets. Uh, if that's the case, the most primary signal when we're not doing our job is when we're dropping packets. Um, so this draft really came from the operational requirement of minimizing network packet loss uh, through automating the, uh, automating the mitigation of uh, detected packet loss. Um, next slide, please. So to set, set the context, um, this is a um, you know, simplistic view of an operational pipeline. We've got uh, raw data coming in at the left. Uh, from a packet loss perspective, we've got active monitoring and passive monitoring, detecting packet loss, obviously other data like event data. Um, go through a detection phase, anomaly detection, uh, uh, thresholding, um, and then that translates our time series into events, which then go into correlation and root cause analysis. And then ideally, we understand from the correlation and root cause analysis that the set of stuff we've got coming in relates to one particular problem, and we know what to do about it, in theory. Um, I'm going to focus on the packet loss side. So um, we've got two signals of packet loss here from active monitoring and passive monitoring. Um, next slide, please. Um, so if we want to auto-mitigate packet loss events, we need accuracy of the measurement, and we also need to understand root cause. Um, if our options are active monitoring and passive monitoring, uh, active monitoring is sampling in time and space and doesn't give you clear indication of cause. So to satisfy this problem statement, we need clear, um, uh, clear signal from passive monitoring. Um, and what we're trying to do is uh, understand, have we got an anomaly? Understand that to a low, le to a low level, of, to a high level of accuracy, so even low level loss. Understand which device and what cause. Um, Bless you. Uh, just real quick, could you, in, in the future, use your show of hands tool to join ah. the queue ahead of time? But please give your name and uh, okay. name, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, Greg Mirsky Erickson. Uh, quick question. So uh, you refer to active and passive. Is it in the context of RFC 7799? Uh, I'm, I'm using active monitoring to mean when we're putting probing on the network to detect loss. So um, uh, IPPM or whatever it may be. And I'm using passive to mean when we're getting the, the data direct from the device itself. Yeah. Um, so um, the RFC 7799 establishes three types of measurements. 
So active, passive, as you uh, noted, and uh, let's refer to something in between, a hybrid. So the hybrid is probably can be uh, seen as on-path telemetry, where the data traffic can be uh, enhanced with their, uh, some additional shim uh, to, to instrument the monitoring performance. So uh, what I understand probably uh, in active you mean injecting test packets specifically constructed as well as using hybrid uh, to do measurements. Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, I mean injection traffic into the network. I don't mean in this context hybrid. Uh, um, I'm, I'm really talking about passive. Uh, I think hybrid is a method for disseminating that data, but it's not mm. fundamentally solving the problem. Of I probably will not. I would still believe that hybrid can be used in different uh, aspects of measuring performance metrics and in some cases including uh, packet loss, for example, alternate marking method uh, can be used to do uh, measurements on the data traffic. Yes, I won't disagree with that. Um, packet loss. I won't disagree with that. Focus here is on uh, unsampled, accurate measuring, measurement of all loss with cause. Um, okay, uh, okay, we, we can continue on, on the list. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, given that problem statement, um, if we want to apply auto mitigation, there are only a relatively small number of auto mitigation actions you can apply in a live network to, um, uh, to mitigate packet loss. We can take a device or a link out of service or a set of links or devices. We can put a link or device back into service. We can roll back a change. We can move traffic or we can escalate it to a person to do something with. And ideally, we don't want to do that last one. We want to try and make sure that we've covered everything with the first. And so for that, we need, uh, uh, we need precise, precise signal of uh, impact. Um, an example of where we're not precise is if, for example, we have loss on a device, we, take, we imagine it's due to errors, we take it out of service, but actually it's due to congestion, we've made the problem worse. Um, so how do we get that signal? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and this is an example of wh where we make the problem worse. Uh, so there are two primary metrics that are implemented, uh, that are in pretty much every implementation from all vendors and open source in terms of reporting packet loss. IF in uh, and IF out discards and IF in and IF out errors, which were obviously defined a very long time ago, uh, and are both ambiguous. Um, IF in discards, um, last um, sentence of this quote, one possible reason for discarding such a packet could be to free up packets uh, buffer space. So it could be, it's, it's not, doesn't list any of the other reasons. And in practice, we see a lot of variation in terms of how it gets implemented. This could include intended discards, ACL discards, it can include unintended discards. Um, similarly, if we look at IF in errors, the number of inbound packets containing errors preventing them from being delivered to a higher layer protocol. It doesn't say here that they're discarded or not. And what we see is in some implementations, it counts non-discarded errors. In others, it counts discarded errors because it just doesn't apply. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, sorry, we have another question. Great. I used the tool this time. Uh, Greg Mirsky Erickson. Um, so um, I have a question. Uh, when you have measurements, so all measurements gets to mitigation, uh, all the uh, occurrences of the packet was, or there is some uh, evaluation uh, step that decides, oh, uh, we are intolerable for this particular uh, service that we monitor, or we are above the threshold. Of tolerance. Yeah. Yes, there's, uh, there, there's that, that was that uh, de detection step mm -hmm. in the earlier slide, and I'll cover that a little bit later. Oh, okay, because uh, actually I think that there is some interesting uh, intersection between uh, this work and work in IPPM working group on precision availability metrics. So it will be interesting for us to discuss. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Thank be you. Good to talk up. Um, so they're the two primary metrics in, uh, implemented pretty much everywhere, all platforms. Um, and there are a lot of other discard metrics implemented, but they're implemented uh, inconsistently. And some of the things that we've experienced, 
Um, not reporting all discards, which is actually quite common. Um, and in which case then, even though the discard is on the box in a, in a hardware metric, in a metric somewhat, in a metric somewhere, it's not exported. It appears like a, uh, like a gray failure. Um, duplicate reporting, which is, you know, really difficult because then you can't recourse. Um, same ID can actually mean different things on different platforms. Um, the IFN errors is, is, is classic for that. Um, which is the next one. Um, and then, you know, the uh, uh, reporting, uh, reporting the loss associated with different entities, which can be interface, it can be platform, and in some cases, it can be something in between the two things. Um, so that inconsistency doesn't help. Um, last point, uh, there, there are no clearly defined semantics, and that's why you and we are, the fact that we don't have a, a broad classification and we don't have... Um, the semantics is why we have the inconsistency. Um, next slide, please. So, in order to address that, we defined a classification scheme which we implemented across uh, a number of platforms from a number of vendors by essentially working backwards from the problem, the actions we were trying to take, and then working backwards to the underlying counters in the platform, mapping the underlying hardware counters, which uh, I think in the most was up to 256 um, into those uh, into those discard metrics, uh, into those classes. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is the classification scheme. Uh, broadly, break it down into intended discards and unintended discards. And then on unintended discards, break it down by type and by subtype. Uh, you can see those here, and they're, and they're in the document. But essentially, this, was, this breakdown was the... Uh, the minimum breakdown in order to be able to determine what actions uh, what actions to take. Uh, next slide, please. Um, on semantics, it's uh, uh, um, there's a longer version in the draft, but the simple version is uh, report all packet uh, all packet drops once and only once where they occur and in the right class. Uh, next slide. Um, I think the question we had earlier on from uh, Greg was: uh, uh, Is there a, a stage where you consider whether or not the metrics are anomalous or not. And yes, there is. And, and, and there's an example here. Um, if you look at the, um, we ignore the first uh, row and look at the TTL discards. Um, all networks have TTL discards to a level. Uh, um, uh, if what we see is below that level, we may choose to do nothing. If we see a high level of TTL discards for a short period of time, it might be that we've got uh, convergence going on. If we see a consistent high level of uh, TTL discards, then you know, it may be an indication of another issue, like a routing loop, for example. Uh, so yes, uh, um, I think for, for each of the classes, you know, there's a set of uh, cause, uh, um, uh, loss rate, action, uh, and there's an example of that in the draft. Question. You have quite a few questions right now. Uh, Rob, I think you're first. Okay, uh, then uh, Thomas, you're second. Okay, you're going to go at the end. Okay, okay. and uh, uh, okay. okay. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so um, uh, I realise we're over, so I'll try and be brief. Um, uh, experience of having done this, so done this across uh, multiple platforms from multiple vendors. Um, the number of discard classes that you choose is a compromise. Um, obviously, um, if you've got a, a, 100 discard, a 100 classes on a large number of interfaces, it's a lot of data. And it, it can actually add to less clarity, not more clarity. You really want the minimum that you need to be to determine what action to take. Um, lots of confusion over null root discards and no root discards when you implement, um, when you're when you use a default null root to implement to to drop drop packets with no root, um, so you know you need to look look deep to understand that. Um, confusion over uh, common confusion on platforms over uh, packets dropped for two a two CPU ACL discards versus transit ACL discards. Um, similarly, confusion over. Um, TTL discards where the CPU has responded versus the total number of CPU discards, uh, TTL discards that the box sees. Because um, the number responded will be small because there'll be a two CPU policer, but the number actually being dropped can be very large. 
Um, and the last one is that, uh, that even if you were to implement this classification scheme, there are things that you can't detect. So uh, um, configuration errors, clearly you can't detect when something is wrong. You can't detect that from the metrics alone. You need some other context, like I undertook a change in the last X minutes, and therefore, um, uh, in that context, this is anomalous. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so that's, I guess, the, how this draft came about. Um, it's, we've written it as an information model rather than uh, a data model, um, anticipating that this could be implemented in different ways. Um, it, this is something that we have done in, in practice. Um, and the reason for writing the draft is, is to try and, you know, I guess, ease the, well, firstly, get feedback so that we can improve that model. But secondly, um, try and get the benefit of applying, of, of using that more broadly so that everybody doesn't have to go through the same process. Um, and yeah, lastly, there is a presentation with a bit more detail from Nano. Uh, questions? Uh, so Rob Wilson, so thank you for bringing this. This is great to think to, um, to bring this here. So it's really interesting. I definitely think it's and anything we have to clarify what the meaning of the counters are and say this is what they are and to make it very clear that even if you give an update a more specific count, you need to also update, update a generalized counter. I think that's great because I think it's some confusion there. So, so that's good in terms of getting better tighter definitions. I would like to get more towards the data models and the information models because uh, I think that that's probably more practical that when people are reading them, they'll be reading the Yang or the MIB, that sort of thing, so you need to get them into those. I do still wonder, though, I think this will help. I'm not sure it will fix your issues in the sense that when it comes down to populating these counters, sometimes it's really hard because the, the error counters that are in the hardware don't quite match up to the categories that you have, and all the hardware is a bit different. And the way that these interfaces might be modeled in the hardware might be a bit different. So there's, there's often always a bit of a compromise as to how you fudge them in uh, as best you can. So I think you also maybe want to have a, a, like an exceptions count that's outside of this of, of I couldn't quite get this in the right place somehow. Yeah, you're, you're, you're right. The, um, you know, any classification scheme doesn't have a perfect fit to, to everything. Um, well, I, I, a point I would add to that, though, is... I, I would actually like vendors to, ex if we agreed a classification scheme, for them to expose their underlying mapping to the classes so that then, you know, you understand what's going on and yep. you can have a discussion over, actually, I think, you know, a layer two MCU is got, shouldn't be in that category, it should be over here. And the, and the one last thing to comment on that is effectively, it's also the case that when we had the MIB counts defined over time, it felt like the hardware uh, as that evolved, they started to try and um, make, uh, match those buckets and things effectively. So you've got some sort of standardization over a period of 10, 20 years towards the right thing. So it takes a while. But yeah, I think it's a good thing to do. So thanks. thank you. Uh, Thomas Graf from Swisscom. So first of all, I think this is really interesting work. Also, thanks a lot that you bring that to OPS AWG. Uh, I like a lot, uh, in the beginning, you uh, clearly outline basically uh, for an anomaly detection system, uh, such kind of an information model and semantics is really important. And especially that you're describing the, the causality, the reason, uh, uh, I think that's very valuable for the uh, operator. One thing to mention here is uh, I'm also driving a document more for anomaly detection, where I believe that kind of information is actually very valuable, especially in context of outlier detection. And uh, have you considered uh, increasing the scope not only for dropped packets, but also bring causality and the reasons, for instance, into the control plane? So for instance, when uh, passes are withdrawn, why they have been withdrawn and so on, would that be also something of interest? Um, yeah, I'd say that that's another area, another area of work oh, for this. Uh, I think we're trying to keep it quite clean on discards to to try and solve that problem, I guess. Sure. Um, but you're right. The, the same con the same concepts you could apply in other areas. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Exactly. And then the last thing uh, I see also some relationship to towards uh, what we have in IPFIX already with the forwarding status field. And here uh, we have another document which is currently the forwarding status updating. And I think uh, there are a common a, a few reasons uh, or reason codes which are currently not being supported there. 
So it would be interesting to see uh, your work, how it could uh, update uh, their more recent goals. Yeah, absolutely. I think it'd be great to have that discussion. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Thomas. Hi, John. This is Benoit Claire yeah, speaking. Benoit. So, uh, yeah, this is good work. We're all after these type of counters. And then the, the reason why I like the fact that it's an information model, because whenever you do your slides about all the branches, it's going to, time one, going to come from MIP, from Yang, from IPPM, from IPSLA, from all of these. So the information model part is like important. The mapping that you mentioned, that's a key thing that we'll have to do right. Coming back on the following one, we've got like a four different states for the IP fix falling status information element. And we try to do exactly what you had with the different causes. So we've got unknown for what it dropped and consume. And for drop, we've got about 12 different reason. Access is denied, dropped, GTL, but total lengths, et cetera. We don't go quite into the detail that you wanted, but it's exactly what we're trying to do for L3, you don't have it for L2. So that's why I come back to the mapping thing that we'll have to do. And the, why we focus on the following status is that because you could change a key field of the flow record and see which more, with more granularity exactly which flow records are dropped, yeah. as opposed to just see drops generically. Absolutely. Thank you, and it, thank you very much. Just to, just to add to that, I, I think there's a you know, there's a valuable workflow in operations, which is I have an anomaly detected through aggregate metrics, but I don't actually know what to do with it until I can identify the flow that's causal. And then, so linking those two, yeah, absolutely. So, so thank you, um, way over time. Sorry. Clearly there is interest in here. Greg, Thomas, Benoit, Rob, on list, this would be a phenomenal discussion to bring others into, thank you. Uh, let's see, we've got, and we do have buffer. I'm not, I'm not terribly panicky at this point. Uh, uh, Chin. Incident management. Incident management, here we go. even with the technical difficulties, not panicky at this point. Built buffer in, this time I like, I, yeah. And even then I built buffer in because I wanted to give everyone the, the shot that they wanted. Chin, all you man. Yeah, thank you for the chair. And uh, so uh, I want to present this incident management for network service. Actually, uh, in the previous speaker talk about a network anomaly detection. I think uh, probably related, I didn't have time to comment, but uh, very interesting. And uh, for incident management, uh, next. Um, actually, this is really, uh, you know, built on top of network topology visibility and, uh, you know, really uh, can, can be used uh, to do this you know, network anomaly detection and uh, more than that, actually. So I want to recap a little bit of uh, why we want to propose this kind of work. When we do this, perform this network uh, diagnosis, actually, one challenge we're facing is uh, uh, you, you need to deal with uh, various different data sources, such as uh, uh, alarm data, KPI data, trace data. And uh, this, uh, uh, you know, uh, Data actually uh, is uh, huge. Actually, uh, take alarm data as example. You may actually connect a huge amount of the alarm data in high frequency and uh, data connection rate. Actually, so traditional we use you know data uh, uh, compression mechanism to uh, reduce the amount of the alarm data. And uh, but the, you know usually uh, this you know time consuming and labor intensive. In addition, actually without you know uh, interlayer network topology. Uh, correlation or uh, without you know, correlation with network topology data, it's hard to assess the impact of the alarm data, KPI data, or log data on the network service. So these are usually result in you know, no processing efficiency or in, in, inaccurate root cause analysis. In some cases, it may cause you know, troubleshooting tickets uh, duplication. So this work really proposed you know, network-wide you know, incident solution. Actually, this can be used to you know, establish connection not only with the network service, but also network topology. In addition, actually, we uh, define the uh, IPC using young data model, and uh, you can see this as open API to investigate this kind of incident. So we can provide the uh, you know, network incident uh, lifecycle management. Next. 
uh, I want to uh, recap a little bit, uh, you know, revisit the history of this uh, draft, actually. Uh, this draft can be seen as a common building block uh, for, you know, uh, uh, network diagnosis actually can be not only used in the IP network, but also in the uh, optical network. Therefore, actually, we work, work with, uh, you know, optical team actually in CCAM, and uh, uh, we first present in the, you know, CCAM working group in routing, uh, in routing area, but also in NetCorp working group in office area. We, uh, one feedback we get is, you know, uh, how this align with, uh, you know, trace context uh, really work actually. And uh, later on, actually, we present in office, uh, uh, OPSAWG working group for twice, and so this is uh, third time. And uh, we get a lot of uh, feedback and input actually offline and uh, in the meeting actually. So in the latest version actually, what we do uh, is, you know, we uh, try to polish the current motivation and goal of this draft in the in, uh, introduction section. Also, we actually update, uh, you know, sample use case. Uh, 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 actually, we actually uh, introduce a new use, use cases based on the uh, feedback from Luis, actually, uh, one of the use cases may be related to the Greg Misky, um, uh, you know, he mentioned that it's a PAM in IPPM. So we also added a reference to this IPPM PAM uh, working with, uh, doc document. So I want to focus on uh, three use cases update and also the model design uh, update. Next. The first use case is actually we try to, you know, uh, you know uh, reduce the duplicate troubleshooting tickets. Uh, uh, you know, take alarm management example, we connect the alarm data, usually we use a pre configured wide uh, list to fill the data. Uh, in, in many cases, you know, these uh, data uh, filter uh, can be set, you know, more uh, strict or maybe uh, set more uh, cause uh, granularity. So it usually uh, cause, uh, you know, multiple uh, troubleshooting tickets maybe uh, dispatched to the same network fault that we call the duplicate troubleshooting tickets. If the you know, data filtering uh, is set too uh, restrict, uh, you may just receive very few troubleshooting tickets to address the issue. So we propose this kind of incident uh, management can be integrated uh, into the uh, new uh, management system. So you not only you can connect the alarm data, but also uh, KPI or performance data or log data, other data. And then you can use this uh, data correlation mechanism or uh, another is a service impact analysis. Uh, either you can, uh, you know, uh, pre-configure, you know, relationship between the network service and the network uh, incident, or you can use the service impact analysis to uh, dynamically establish the uh, dependency relationship between the network service and network dependency. So this can, you know, uh, reduce the uh, duplicate troubleshooting tickets. Um, yeah, next. Uh, in second uh, use cases, actually, you can see uh, uh, we, uh, you know, they fixed, focus on, you know, how we can generate this network incident based on SLO violation. So in this case, we gave an example. For example, you have several VPN sites, you want to, uh, you know, get them set up to talk with each other, and also you can monitor the traffic, uh, you know, pass through this VPN traffic and uh, uh, monitoring the, the, the performance of this traffic, uh, you know, go through uh, different uh, VPN side, for example, VPN side A to VPN side B. So uh, we actually introduced a, a, a QOE related uh, metric we call the uh, L3 VPN service availability. And uh, so we can use uh, this metric to measure end-to-end -end latency uh, in terms of the level of the packet. So you can allow uh, different level of the packet loss, for example, uh, from the VPN side A to VPN side B. Actually, you need to make sure the end-to-end -end medicine will not uh, exceed uh, 20 milliseconds for 99% of the packet. So when this kind of uh, metric, you know, exceed the threshold, we will, you know, uh, you know automatically uh, generate this network incident. And so this can be reported to the OSS. Um, next. In several user cases, actually related to multi-layer for the management. So you may deal with um, RP plus optical, this kind of uh, hybrid scenario. Traditional way, you know, use uh, uh, IP layer uh, NMS to uh, manage the uh, IP layer alarm data and use the optical uh, uh, ma management system to manage the optical layer alarm data. But, uh, you know, the, 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 the challenge is usually this RP uh, operation team, like a collaboration with optical operation team. So, uh, so in these cases, uh, uh, if the you know some fault happen, you know in the interlayer linker, you know between the 
uh, IP layer network device and optical layer network device. So who will uh, take care of this? So usually may involve some human uh, manual uh, process, uh, human involved to you know to do this kind of manual troubleshooting. So this really cause uh, you know uh, uh, long uh, locate, uh, fault locating time. So to uh, address the challenge, actually we can you know introduce. Uh, uh, hierarchy uh, management system, we, we introduce a uh, uh, multi-domain uh, orchestrator. They can coordinate with, uh, you know, IP layer uh, management system and optical management system. So they can connect not only each layer alarm data, but also the, the data in the inter-layer uh, uh, links. So, and then you can use the incident uh, life cycle management to uh, investigate the, the, the incident, to change the incident uh, data. So this can, uh, you know, make uh, you know IP operation team to work together with the uh, optical operation uh, operation team, and so this also can reduce uh, for the locating time. Uh, next, so this is uh, the proposed model design. Actually, you can see the model structure for the IETF incident. So you you can see actually, uh, I want to highlight this. You know, we introduce service instance uh, uh, leave. So this can describe you know, a relationship with the network service. So each network incident can associate with one or multiple network service instance. In addition, we introduce a, a network domain or an, an a source. So this describes the relationship with network topology. So this uh, actually uh, relate to the uh, RFC uh, 8345. Uh, and uh, so we can, you know, build on top of this network topology. So, and, and uh, we, we can see how this can be correlated with network topology. In addition, actually, we define the RPC. So you can see it's as an open API, we can exchange incident information. So this is a high idea for this module design. Next. So we think this actually has been around for a while. Actually, we uh, think it's a good basis. Actually, uh, we actually got, uh, recently got comments from Luis and uh, to introduce uh, the uh, service on availability monitoring use cases. So we we'll, uh, uh, explore how the model can, can, uh, can be extended to maybe introduce some new parameter to support these kind of use cases. And uh, we see the key value of this network incident is, you know, reduce uh, troubleshooting tickets actually also can help improve the network uh, maintenance efficiency because you can assess the impact of alarm or uh, KPI on the network service. In addition, actually, this incident can be used in multi-layer, multi-domain. So they really provide the multi-layer, multi-domain handy tools uh, to provide uh, good network observability. So we would like working group to consider to adopt this and comms are welcome. Yes, thank you. So I'm gonna tempt fate. Uh, I put up, I think, oh, I did. Um, for those of you who have read this work, uh, please respond to the poll. Uh, is there interest in adopting this draft? Yes, no, no opinion. Yes, you think you're interested in, in OPSOG adopting this? No, we should not, or no opinion. You either haven't read it or you don't care. It's kind of stabilizing, maybe. Stabilizing, um, and looks like Paolo turned on his camera. Um, so it looks like there is, I mean, there's 57 people with no opinion, but it, it seems like there might be enough worth taking it to the list and seeing what the, uh, the yeah. list thinks. Uh, any comments, questions? I want to add one more comment. That we actually, I forgot to mention actually, we, on Tuesday, we also want to organize a signing meeting to discuss this incident management to say more use cases. I want to invite, you know, uh, John Evan to, to John. I think it's more relevant. Also, yes, yeah, so, uh, Thomas, welcome. Yeah. Same comment to you, Chin. If you haven't, I can't remember if you just sent it to the chairs, but make sure you publicly on the list invite okay. people to the side. Sure, meeting. sure. Yeah. Rob? Uh, could you go back to slide six, please? So I have to say, I've about no opinion on this because I haven't read the data, latest version of the document, so I didn't really know. So I think this is definitely an interesting problem to be trying to solve. So, I, so in terms of you trying to solve this problem, I think that's great. I think the thing that, um, I don't know if you can lose the poll on the screen. Sorry. Sorry. Um, so in terms of looking at this slide, it wasn't clear to me whether, well, two things. One is how you actually correlate the IP uh, layer alarms and the optical layer alarms together into the same incident. So I think that's going to be the really tricky bit is to get those to be the same thing. 
Yeah. So that, I think that's interesting problem. And the other thing that, that occurs to me is it wasn't clear to me in terms of, again, this, this sort of translation, whether you are therefore saying rather than these being reported as separate IP and optical layer alarms, you now report these as incident alarms. So you sort of generalize those. Yeah. And if you do that, uh, my question is, how do you model the extra um, detailed data that was previously held in those separate alarm structures into uh, an incident form that's more generic. So I think that's the interesting thing is, if you end up just putting this all into strings or description fields, you're gonna lose the structure of the data. If you allow it to be hierarchical and extensible, then that's gonna be really interesting. So, um, so that's the other thing I thought was an interesting problem here as to how to um, marry those two things up. Yeah. Uh, so an interesting problem, I think it's pretty worth, I, I, I think it's interesting working on this stuff, but I'm not sure I know exactly what the solution should look like. Yeah, we will explore, yeah, more, we'll uh, try to address your, your comments. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. and so one of the thoughts was like, whether it should be a hash number, you have an instant record and then you should be tying that back as extra metadata on the original alarms as well, or something like that, maybe. Yeah, right, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to comment on the relationship to the topology and, Olga, and the information you, uh, about the layers. Olga, can you uh, um, make the mic closer to your... Yeah, uh, Olga Havel, Huawei. Uh, I just wanted to comment about the relationship to the topology and the layering. What I believe is that because there will be different things that topology has to connect to, like incidents and configuration and symptoms and, you know, inventory, I think maybe it would be uh, good to do it in some generic way from the topology itself so that we can work together in the way how it is connected, that we don't have different, completely different solutions for incidents versus configuration versus inventory. Yeah, yeah. O okay. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. We can uh, take it offline. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jen. Yeah, thank you. Diego. Sorry, but my back is in a not very good position. Hey, man, I hear you. Request some time to, to stand up. That's okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, well, this is the uh, second version, the zero one of uh, of the proposal that I first introduced in in San Francisco. Can you move on? Just to just as a reminder, it's about provenance. It's about uh, ensuring that the, the origin and integrity of uh, JAN datasets, when they are not used uh, or, or they cannot, this cannot be derived from a, from a direct evidence from the uh, from the data flow. For example, data lakes or what is being used for for AI uh, training, and to apply all the trails whatever else that is related to uh, ensuring this provenance without uh, without the direct evidence from the data flow. The means is uh, to use COSI as a signature to apply it for any of the serialization methods uh, that are proposed and to use a mechanism that is extremely comfortable for doing this in COSI that is the, uh, detaching the, uh, the payload from the signature. Can you move on? So, when I presented this in San Francisco, I, my impression was that there was interest in the group and uh, there was uh, some energy that, uh, well, the circumstances um, has made, have made not so, uh, not so strong because I, I have been uh, focused in, in other uh, obligations, so the changes are not as many as I would like to, to, to bring here. There has been some rate uh, has been corrected, some comments, on uh, the idea of using, of applying this provenance in data pipelines, which is very much connected, I guess, to what, uh, for example, Chang was uh, telling before. And the uh, idea of the recursion of how you relate it, to how you can nest signatures are um, already addressed in the text. Still some open comments that were originally, I mean, most of them come from the discussion in San Francisco regarding where to place the signature, um, and uh, how to deal with the idea, because the current proposal is to use COSI with a sign one construct that allows only one signer for the, uh, for the whole thing. There was uh, somebody in the, uh, in the, during the discussion in San Francisco making some notes that probably could be interesting to consider to support multiple signatures. 
and that brings uh, the point is that brings some some consideration of in general at the station mechanisms as well for 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 young and this is something that it's still open can you move on so for the recursion and should be recursion and not recursion. I wasn't reviewing this, and there was uh, this is the problem of making this at certain time in the in the night. Many rata without uh, without spell checking. That's uh, so. The idea is that uh, I have tried to clarify the fact that you can nest signatures with the current proposal. The idea is that the mechanism allows you to uh, uh, the. Uh, advocates for having a single signature element that is, it contains the cozy signature of all the young elements that contains it with the exception of the signature itself. So you can have a chunk of junk like this, you sign the whole thing and you associate the signature with it. If inside there is another element, you can simply sign it by doing the same procedure taking that, that part, signing it, and including the signature there. That implies that when you're going to sign the whole thing, you would sign as well the element that would contain the signature in the inner, in the internal, in the inner uh, element as well. So the idea is that you can aggregate signatures. You can aggregate data, you can, you can take pieces of junk that are already, already signed, sign them yourselves, and share it. So the the integrity of the aggregate will be associated with the aggregator, the integrity of the individual uh, components will be aggregated with the original one. The idea is that this is this support, as I said, this, uh, this idea of that provenance, provenance verification can be done in a recursive way. Can uh, 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 analyze the components of the whole depending on who, are, who has provided the, uh, this. This is intended, I mean, I have dedicated some time to try to clarify this in the text. Should be clear, if you have a, a read of it, if it is not clear yet, we, I'll try to improve it. Can you move on, please? With the signature placement, uh, during the meeting, I took notes and, and afterwards in some discussions on the, these ideas, as a, in addition to the, uh, to the one proposed in the draft is totally transparent, this just to put Put it wherever you feel like as a leaf at the, same, at the level of the, uh, of the component that is being signed, whatever it is, but just one. That's, that's the only condition. There was some uh, suggestion about using uh, annotation. I'm reading the, the annotation draft. I was a little bit concerned about, uh, serial, the, the, uh, about the serialization neutrality because CBOR, as far as I can tell, is not contemplated there. So it's something. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure whether it is the case. There was a, 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 a um, suggestion of using, of using it for junk push. And uh, well, that's some, it was not clear to me from the comments and the discussion in which part of the junk push, whether it's part of a, of a RPC parameter or as part of the junk elements. I tend to believe that it would, make the, uh, it would mean the young elements, but because it, become, it would become a particular case of the, uh, of the general proposal. And it's the same if we go for the, uh, for the young base files, if we allow as well that is associated with the young structure on the, in, the, in the same file. So the, the question here is, uh, is whether you believe, I personally I believe it, but this is something that I would like to, to get some feedback is that I believe that in this document, we can consider the case for the uh, junk push and the, and the, uh, and the, uh, and the junk base files can be considered a general, a, a particular cases of the general case of putting the, the signature, whatever you see fit. And that would imply for sure a, a, an update of the notification and the file metadata schemas but it would be for, for signature and, and would be enough to have this, this modification of this proposal in this document without changing or making a, any updates on the, on the previous one. For the annotations, I don't see any problem in adding it in the annotations, simply proposing a new kind of annotation and asking someone that is working on CBOR about the, uh, the, the CBOR extension in the, in the future. So this is, will be the, the next, uh, uh, my next um, uh, target. Next one, please. 
on this. You have uh, two questions. You want to take them now, or do you want to wait? Uh, yeah, well, no, if people, yeah, yeah, that would be. Uh, Alex? Oh, uh, yeah. I did on, sorry. That's okay, man. We're, 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 we're looking out for you. <laughs> Um, Alex Wang in Salian. Uh, so two comments on here. Seabor is a young seabor you are referring to, I believe. So for the seabor encoding, I believe that it would be transparent as JSON. So that's, I, I believe there is no issue in there. Uh, I have a comment on how to validate the message. Uh, this signature placement, I believe it's important. And the way you use it, breaks a bit the validation. How can, from a data plane perspective, know if there is a signature or there is not, because you are not changing the young module. For a specific use case for young push, I would suggest to add this cause signature in the young push header instead, and not just placing whenever you, you want, as you propose in the draft. That would easy a lot uh, the mm -hmm. young validation. And uh, yeah, that was uh, in a way my comment. Okay, so well, we, we we'll talk later about this. So yeah, no problem. The other Alex, only only Alex is yes. here. So. <laughs> yes, uh, Alex. Um, um, yeah. So I think the one one comment actually regarding also the placement issue. I think actually you don't need to even modify Yang push or uh, auto notification. You can mm -hmm. accommodate it. Just basically have a separate signer, basically basically second, a separate validator, and basically it generates the notifications for all of the messages that, that that go out from there. I think I do think this can be easily accommodated or in straightforward okay. way. Okay. Those so we can yeah. talk also afterwards. No, no, yes. that, that's good. What they, 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 uh, what they had in mind. Thank you. It's good. It's good yeah. to, to to have uh, some. Uh... Uh, hi. Yes. So, so I haven't really laid it in the draft. So I think I had one comment effectively on terms of Yang-based files and things. So the Yang packages draft is sort of languishing somewhat as the version work is going a bit slowly at the moment. But one of the concepts we're considering there was the ability to add checksums to the Yang files that you were uh, uh, included in the package. Mm -hmm. So in that case, I think I'd put SHA-256 or SHA-512 hashes in, but it's the same idea effectively having some uh, guarantee of the file. Um, you got look like a confused look on your face. No, no, no. I'm I'm, I'm just thinking whether no, no. It was about to ask you whether you have a reference on that because I I, I have not spotted it. Uh, the, okay, the, I the think, checksums. Oh yes, it was taken out the latest version. I can find an earlier version of where we had them in, and the reason it was taken it out at the time was, was like people weren't sure whether that was the necessary complexity to add in that time. We took it out and maybe we should go back in. One thing that we hit that was we were struggling with was what what is the checksum of a Yang file? Is it uh, just a checksum of the text, mm -hmm. in which case that makes white space suddenly become significant because it changes, yeah. or do you have to define a canonical <laughs> Yang structure representation to convert it to and then do the checksum thing? So that was the interesting thing. And again, there's a related discussion in NetMod about the versioning, that open question about whether white space is significant or not and what that means is an open question on the versioning stuff. So you can, you're welcome to join, join that discussion. <laughs> Sorry. No, no this, is, this is always the, the, the joy of can, canonicalization. That is, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's, uh, I, I mean, if, if you can share with me some, some reference or have a, have a check or if you think that this could go to somehow where we could bring in a certain moment, this to netbond, I'm, I'm happy. I mean, just... Uh... Yes, I wasn't so much saying, give me any direction of where they should go, what to do. It was more just a be, like a be aware, just to, to let you know that exists uh, for you to take into account, because I don't know the answer here. Okay. <laughs> well, I guess that we are almost done. If you move to the... Uh... So, uh, plans for the uh, next uh, period, and I hope with more energy, it's... Uh, uh, to solve the, the, uh, this, all these issues with the signature placement, with the help of, uh, of the Alexis and, and, the, uh, and the reference that uh, we were discussing with Rob. We keep, I, I keep in the idea of uh, refining and detailing the use cases. It's, they are general and it would be good to, to have you go into more detail. Consider the implication of multiple signatures. This is something that is, I mean, I, I mean when, when thinking about this, my idea was to keep it as simple as possible, and that's why this is the same one. Well, considering this is something that it uh, would be worth, uh, we, we, we would need to think a little bit on the implications in terms of the uh, 
potential use cases and the additional complications for, for uh, verification and the generation of the signatures, or think whether there should be another construct that would be separated. Go for the practical evaluation. I am glad to say that just before coming here, the, I got confirmed that there was going to be a student working with, uh, with us on this. I mean, and this, uh, uh, there is a commitment that uh, she will be working on this and in, uh, not on, on anything else. So I, I hope to have a practical implementation soon. And I'm glad to uh, say as well that we have involved a course expert. Can, can, you, can I point you? This gentleman. <laughs> that is going to help us with the, with the cozy uh, um, aspect. And so, I, well, the idea is to, to continue working with this and bring something probably, I mean, it might be that for the uh, Brisbane, we can show something at the hackathon, hopefully. And that's all. I, uh, I locked the queue. Sounds like, though, there is potential for discussion on lists. So thank you, Diego. Yeah. Thank you. Christian, and I see you are there. You are Yes. Black. Can you hear me? We can. You're a little. Uh, you're you're talking right into your mic. It sounds like. Uh, okay. Um, so is it very loud or? Uh, it's very distorted. Okay. Uh, let me see. Is this better? That's much better. Much better. Okay. Excellent. Um, okay. So um, uh, my name is Christian Larson, right? And I uh, would like to talk to you about storing Yang-based uh, telemetry in time series databases. Next slide, please. So here is the big picture idea. Uh, we have some telemetry collector here in the upper left uh, corner. It subscribes to some Yang path uh, on a network device, a router in the uh, bottom left corner. It could also be doing polling in case you don't have a subscription if that's not available, right? Um, we then receive some telemetry data from the router uh, into the collector, and the collector uses a Yang model to parse and validate this data that we, de uh, that we then want to insert into our time series database that we see at the center of this diagram. Uh, so that we, from there, can draw pretty graphs like we see in the bottom right corner. We also want to enable other systems to consume this data, and if they have the Yang model, they can consume the data programmatically by querying time series database. So the Yang model acts as, a, as an index of all the data available in the time series database. For this to work in a generic fashion, we need an encoding uh, or sort of representation of Yang model data in a time series database. Uh, and we want this to be model driven so that the collector can support any Yang model uh, without needing uh, bespoke, manually written and, and sort of hard coded conversion rules for storing the data in the time series database. Next, please. So how do we do that? Um, here is the, the, the gist of this, um, the core of this mapping specification. So it's about converting, uh, you know, conceptually or a NetConf XML or RESTConf JSON or any conceptual sort of Yang model data into something that we can store in a time series database. And as an example, uh, we have a Yang instance identifier here in the middle. Uh, this is for the IATF interfaces uh, model. So there's first an interfaces container, right? Then the interface list, uh, then the, uh, with the name of the, the, that key, right? Then we got the statistics uh, container, and finally the in unicast packets leaf with its value. So we can then transform this into a representation that is suitable for a time series database. So the, the metric name itself becomes the Yang instance identifier path, but with the keys removed. Uh, and the list key is instead added as a second label, where the label key is uh, the Yang path and the, the, the value is the, uh, well, the Yang list key value here, ethernet zero. So you can see that at the bottom, right? So this is sort of how we separate these out uh, to make the data fit into uh, a time series database. So this is it really, it's a simple uh, example. There are certainly more convoluted or complex ones, but it's the, the core idea and sort of gist of, of this concept. Um, next, please. Uh, real quick, would you mind if I ask a question here? Sure. Uh, Joe Clark, Cisco um, contributor. I noticed that you modeled or, or you, you mapped the path separator uh, in the X path as, as an underscore, as well as you mapped uh, 
dashes to be underscores. I, I've seen in some other projects, the path separator gets modeled as two underscores in case, so a parser might be able to differentiate a path uh, element versus part of a, a, of a single name. I'm wondering yes, why you did the commonality, uh, why you made both here. I, I, I think that's actually an excellent suggestion. Um, this is, I'm going to touch upon this sort of in the next slide, right? But, you know, what is the actual target, right? There are multiple different time series databases and they have different capabilities. In some, maybe we can even keep slash as the path separator. In others, we might be able to use dot or, or something that's, you know, you're not allowed to use in a Yang name. Uh, but indeed, using a single underscore here is is actually a very bad thing because it would collide uh, with with other special characters. So yes, I agree with you, um, and we should fix that so for for the zero one, I, I suppose. Thank you. Um, okay, so you know, yeah, when we talk about a time series database, what do we actually mean, right? So in this case, we target something that I like to think of as label set centric time series databases. Uh, I mean, similar to how you have, you know, SQL and, and relational databases that are, you know, very similar, right? There are different implementations, but they're similar. They follow certain standards. Uh, we have the same thing with time series databases. So at least if you squint a little bit, uh, you, you'll see that they implement this concept where a metric or time series is primarily identified by a set of labels. Um, some systems, they call this tags or, or dimension, but it's really sort of the same thing, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a set of key value pairs. Uh, there can also be like a metric name, but again, you can think of that as just another, uh, another label. Um, so I've listed here at the, at the bottom, you know, a couple of the T's to B's I knew that I had at the top of my head. Um, you know, th there's certainly some variation in their capabilities. The path separator that they would support is, is you know, potentially one. Um, but I would still argue that they all have in common this rough, rough concept of being label set centric. So, I mean, you could imagine that, you know, maybe you want profiles for different databases or something like this to sort of support that, that variation. I I'm not entirely sure. I mean, I, I haven't worked out the details for, for all of these. Um, next, please. Uh, right, so time series database, super common today. Yang, I think, is also super common. It's prevalent on network devices, right? And we're seeing lots and lots of config faults data. Um, I think operationally, many networks today, production networks, they still rely on classic means, like SNMP, but a lot of things are moving, right? And I just wanted to sort of highlight how some of the larger platforms that we have out there, they actually have uh, a really large amount of config faults data. And I think that's really uh, encouraging. So I think we're in a good spot to make uh, good use of this data. Um, next, please. Those large uh, Yang device models together with the scale of the typical service provider network means we end up with a very, very large amount of time series and you know large data set overall, right? You have thousands of P routers with thousands of interfaces. You have probably tens of counters on those. And then you have all the CPs which run in, in sort of the hundreds of thousands or millions of them, right? And you're gonna end up with billions of metrics or at the very least hundreds of millions. Um, this used to be a problem with early generation time series, but I would say it's much less of an issue today. And there are systems, uh, I think M3DB I had um, I mentioned in the last slide, Druid, there are deployments of these that are in the billion range, right? So we're in a good good spot there. Um, here using Yang models, I think can pro provide sort of a unique rich index to get the overview over this just vast amount of data, right? That you just wouldn't be able to achieve otherwise. So I think being model driven is a necessity to work with the data at this scale. And finally, I've included some examples of how we can query this data using this uh, specification. Um, and again, the queries here, you know, they're driven by the structure of the AI models and they work because the data in the time series database, they follow this standardized mapping specification. Next, please. Um, right, so sort of on the goals here and the next steps, well, obviously the, the big goal is to have this deterministic model-driven mapping for programmatic consumption of Yang model telemetry data in stored in time series databases. So uh, first thing is complete the specification and please, you know, come talk to me if you're interested in this topic, right? I'd love to uh, collaborate with people. Uh, we have some proof of concept level code 
uh, that's yeah, it's running, but we need to make further progress on this. I would love to see that go sort of hand in hand to get what specification right, just make sure that everything actually works. I think it is a goal to fit well into existing time series databases and systems, not to rely on some next generation something, but to actually work with production systems that are out there today. Um, and that sort of necessitates the next point, which is self-describing data. Uh, we don't want to have a strict reliance on Yang for the visualization part of this. Uh, all that existing tooling and system that we want to leverage, they are not Yang aware today, right? Similarly, we want it to be suitable for direct human consumption because if the visualization tool is not Yang aware, you know, it's going to present the data without any form of uh, mangling in between. It, it needs to be uh, human consumption friendly, right? Of course, with the model, you get extra metadata. You can then do more things with, uh, with that. So, for example, you could build this sort of dynamic dashboard, right? If you crawl through all the AI models, you can find all the temperature sensors. You could build a dynamic dashboard out of that, stuff like that, right? Uh, I also want to mention here just an, I think what I think is a non-goal. Uh, unlike the XML and JSON, those are encodings that we have in NetConf and RESTConf, right? I think this is less than that. Uh, any XML, any data. Uh, those kinds of leaves, for example, I think are very hard or impossible to represent in a time series database. So this is probably going to be less than that. And that's also why we call this a mapping. Um, finally, alignment with the philatelist graph and perhaps others as well. And I'm out of time. Thank you for listening. Any questions, comments in about a minute or two? Rob is coming to the mic. I'd like to put Thomas on the stand and, and ask him like what effectively is the overlap in terms of what's been done here and, and the, work, the work that Thomas is proposing in terms of the Kafka schema and how that relates. Is there is a correlation? Thomas is coming to the mic. Thomas Graf Swisscom, uh, it complements very much the work we are doing. Uh, at the end, uh, we need a time series data where we need uh, to ingest uh, young semantics. And the work which we are uh, proposing is basically uh, preserving not only the young, young push message, but also the, the schema end to end. So, yeah, complements nicely. Thank you. And Benoit has said in chat, in, uh, Yang and time series database is necessary next step for the industry. And thanks you, Christian, for the work presentation. With that, ladies and gentlemen, it is well, 841 Eastern time. So I guess that's what, 241 here. And we are on to the ops area portion of our agenda. Uh, our esteemed area directors, Rob and Warren, are coming to the stage. I will do any notes for them. Um, and I will So hello everybody. Wow, this microphone sends stuff and directional. Um, this is the ops area portion of the joint ops AWG and ops area meeting. The reason that we have it as a joint meeting is there's usually very little that happens in the ops area part of the meeting. Um, apparently we have how many minutes still? 15, good Lord. Um, Thank you. Wow. Usually you give us 15 and take most of them back. So now I'm just sitting here vamping. I'm assuming that there are no questions for the open mic part. But while you're trying to think of, of questions, hi, I'm Warren Kamari, and this is Rob. Rob. Um, oh, we actually have a question. Benoit, while you're walking up, I will remind people, please fill in the nomcom feedback. Um, if you do not fill in the nomcom feedback, the next time you might get someone like me and that would not be good. Yes, Benoit, so actually it's not a question, but since we have time, there is something happening which is interesting in this ITF is that we start to have many side meetings that are ops related and that are actually 
even sometimes more interesting than the working group wants. So if we have time, maybe the people doing those side meetings might want to introduce what they're doing. Just suggestion. That sounds like a great way to fill up extra time. Um, <laughs> if there are folk here who are running side meetings and want to have a few minutes to remind people of their side meeting, that would be great. However, I will remind everyone side meetings are not official IETF working group meetings. Official IETF work can't happen in them. You know, they're just side meetings. So um, this is purely just informational. If anybody wants to sort of mention, hey, I'm talking about Blarg, please you know, come see my talk about Blarg. So the one I know about, uh, there is one about SRV6 operation management. I believe this is later uh, today. Uh, there is uh, another one tomorrow about Yang and Kafka, half an hour, followed by the digital map uh, POC of it. And there is a, a last one, which I think is on uh, Wednesday about, uh, what's the exact topic? No, it's not the one I was thinking about. It's the one about uh, the uh, uh, open config. Like issues of open config and network manageability, something like that. Exactly. The exact title. And the one, if you want to mention that one. So maybe the people here, if they check the side meeting wiki, they may find some other topics that are in, of interest in terms of related to this area. Yeah, I was just trying to find the URL. If you type in IETF side meetings, I think that that will take you to the wiki page. And there's a list there of side meetings. But a reminder again, you know, side meetings are just side meetings. They don't have any official standing, something, 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 disclaimer, et cetera. Anyone else with a comment or a question? Or would everybody like to end 15 minutes early? Regarding the uh, side meeting, uh, I already, you know, make a, you know, uh, presentation for the, uh, the, the group-based access control and also time schedule. So for uh, time schedule, we actually, we have a side meeting on Thursday afternoon. And uh, for the uh, incident and the management, actually, we have a side meeting on Tuesday afternoon. So welcome to join. And if people want the list, you go to the main IETF page and then down towards the bottom, there's a link to additional events and there's a list there saying public site meetings. So that's the easy way to find them. Um, a suggestion to people who've put in site meetings, put it, including a description would be super helpful um, because some of them just have like the name of a meeting and no other info. And uh, I was just going to re reconfirm the putting non-com feedback in is really helpful for the non-com. So I've not been on the non-com. I've been on the receiving side of it. Um, but effectively, I think that all the input that people put in is read, is taken into account in terms of choosing. So in, depending on who, who you want to represent you as your new uh, ops management AD come March, that now's the time to put feedback in and help the non-com make their decisions. Thank you. Yes, if you don't provide feedback, you lose any right to bitch if you get somebody you don't like. Of course, if you do put in feedback and get someone you don't like, yeah, yeah, okay. Well, I think that this is a good amount of random vamping and side discussions. So unless anybody has a question for ops area in the next 10, 9, 8, Seven six five four three two one. We're done. Thank you, everybody. See you in March in Brisbane, or or see you Wednesday at one p.m. <laughs> or see you Wednesday. Thanks all.